Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Jeff Zog with the National Weather Service in Des Moines. Thank you for joining us today. Today we have an interesting webinar a presentation that will be given by Dr. Larry Kalkstein at the University of Miami in Florida. Uh, we're joined here in the Des Moines office by our partners at the Des Moines uh, Public Health Department uh, in Polk County. Uh, please remember to mute your phones if you're on the, the phone here. Uh, you can press uh, star six to mute your phones, pound six to unmute. What we will do is we'll uh, turn it over to Larry here momentarily for his presentation, and then afterwards we will take questions, and then we'll conclude the webinar. Uh, for those of you who do not know Larry, uh, he has quite, a, quite an accomplished background. He's a professor and member of the voluntary faculty at the University of Miami's Department of Public Health Sciences. Environment, Health, and Public Health Division, Miller School of Medicine, received his undergraduate degree from Rutgers University and his master's and PhD from Louisiana State. His team works closely with international weather, environmental, and public health agencies on projects dealing with the assessment, development, and implementation of heat health watch warning systems for major cities. These systems are funded by both private and government organizations, such as NOAA, National Weather Service, US EPA, various electrical utilities, local health departments, state environmental organizations, and government agencies in other countries. At present, over 30 such systems are in operation in the United States, nine running in Italy, eight in South Korea, three in Canada, and one in China. Dr. Kalkstein and his team are also actively involved in the development of various weather indices for use in applied climatological and climate health analyses. These include air mass-based synoptic classifications and the development of a relative climatological index, the heat stress index, or HSI. Both indices are used widely by researchers around the world. And here in Polk County in Iowa, Dr. Kalkstein has worked with the uh, Polk County Department of Public Health to develop the heat health warning system for Polk County. And today he is going to share his findings uh, as far as uh, trends and some of the air mass characteristics for the Polk County area. So Dr. Kalkstein, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff, and uh, thank you all for coming. It's uh, good to be talking to all of you, um, and it's been fun working with Polk County over the last several years. Uh, I certainly have appreciated wor working with the Department of Health in Polk County, and um, uh, they have funded uh, the effort that we put forth. Uh, in any case, uh, as, as Jeff said, uh, there are several goals to this project. And go to slide two, uh, Jeff. Uh, the first one is uh, we are air mass climatologists or synoptic climatologists. So we don't look at individual temperature and dew point, humidity, things like that. We look at the entire weather situation that is occurring at any given time. And what our group does is we can identify the air mass that is overhead in a place at any given day and at any given time. We can even forecast these well in advance, and we can look historically back to the 1940s to see how many air masses of certain types occurred then as compared to today. So as I'll show you in a bit, uh, one of the goals here was to determine if there are any trends in the frequency of these air masses, um, uh, are the hottest and most uncomfortable ones becoming more frequent from the 40s to today uh, versus the coolest ones, or are they not? So we're looking at the frequency trends over the last 60 or 70 years, and we're also looking at the character trends. So once we isolate the air masses, we want to see if there are any changes in temperature or humidity or any other factor that are occurring within these air masses over that 70-year period. So the idea is to look at trends. Uh, if there are trends, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's human-induced global warming. I'm not here to push a global warming agenda. I'm just here to tell you that there are trends of certain types that we should be wary of. And if it is of the most dangerous air masses, that's something we need to keep our eyes open for. The second part of this, as Jeff has said, uh, we have developed a heat health warning system that is automated and is on a website, a password protected website. We've done this for a number of cities around the world. Uh, the one for Des Moines is accessed by the Department of Health and also by uh, the National Weather Service office where Jeff is. And they can use this heat warning system as guidance to determine when they should call advisories and um, heat warnings, uh, and that's exactly what Jeff and his uh, group do. So we had that system up uh, several years ago, and it was based on mortality data that ended in 2004. 
Since then, we have gained six more years of mortality data, and it now extends to 2010. And we wanted to see if there's been any change in human response uh, in the Des Moines area uh, now that we've added six more years of data and to see if, in fact, people are becoming more or less susceptible to heat. And then we want to discuss the possibility of redeveloping the heat health warning system for Des Moines based upon the newer results. So those are the major goals, to look at the trends in air mass frequency and character, to reevaluate the health response with the new data, and to possibly redevelop the heat health warning system based upon the results that we come out with. Next slide. Uh, the original system, as I said, covered the period up to 2004, and we actually have data on mortality starting in 1975. We have data on everyone who has died in Des Moines every day since 1975. We actually know what they died from. Uh, we know the age of death, the date of death, uh, their race, their sex, and so on. And so you can actually, if you want to, look at everyone who's 65 and older, or African Americans versus white mortality, and so on. But we looked at mortality in general. We have done studies like that, uh, but that's not germane to this study right now. We're doing one for LA County Public Health right now to determine which demographic group is the most vulnerable. Well, as I said, we have recently obtained six more years of the data. So we have redeveloped our evaluation to cover the periods of 1975 to 2014. 1970, excuse me, that should be 1975 to 2004. That's a misprint. 1975 to 2010. And then we also looked at the most recent period, 2000 to 2010. And if we go to the next slide, let's begin our evaluation of the trends of the air masses first. And then we will go into the health response evaluation. Uh, there are about 10 different air masses that affect Des Moines during the summer. Some are cool and comfortable. We call those dry polar. Uh, some are warm and pleasant, uh, dry moderate. Some are hot and humid. We call those moist tropical, or MT. Some are dry and very hot. That's the DT, or dry tropical air mass. We are most interested in the moist tropical, or MT, and the dry tropical, because they are the ones that historically are associated with increased mortality during heat waves. Uh, we actually have a dangerous subset of moist tropical that we call moist tropical plus. That is when the temperature and dew point are above the average moist tropical. They both have to be above the average moist tropical to be classified as moist tropical plus. And about a quarter of the days that are moist tropical classify as moist tropical plus. You can see that their annual frequency, if you look at the y-axis, is somewhere between 5, 10, 15 percent on a given year, maybe even one, a couple of years, over 20 percent. And you can see on the x-axis the period of time from 1945, which was the beginning of the period of the record, right up to almost the present, 2014. And if you look at this moist tropical plus uh, chart of frequency, you can see that there's a large interannual frequency. There are some years when there is very little moist tropical plus air, like in about 1957, around the 1965 period, and so on. And then there are years where it's quite frequent. And way back when, in the 50s and 40s, uh, it looked like around 1950, there were a couple of years that were fairly high, uh, 12, 13 percent. And you can see that at present, there are many years that have become much higher in terms of the frequency. And so we fit a trend line to these data, which plots the frequency during the summer, which we define as June 1st through August 31st, for every summer. Uh, from 1945 to the present. And as you can see, there is an upward trend line. This is the best linear fit that we could get. Uh, you see the algorithm in the upper right-hand corner, uh, which this, the, the constant of 0.0657x means that each year, on average, MT plus increases by a 0.0657th of a day, which would mean every 10 years it would be 0.657 of a day, and then when you go to 20 years, you have over a day, because then it would be about 1.3 days and so on. And you could see that over the 70-year period, the average moist tropical plus 
air mass in a given summer has increased from about five to almost 10 days out of that 92 day period. So there has been a sizable increase in the frequency, which is highly statistically significant, and it's something that we need to make note of. Now again, there are still days today, years today, when you don't have very much moist tropical plus. Uh, you can see like around 2007 or 2008, those years were low. But then you could see recently we've had high frequencies of these air masses. So we note that the moist tropical plus, which is the hot, humid air mass that hits Des Moines in summer and is attributed, attributed to many deaths, heat-related deaths, has increased in a statistically significant fashion. Dry tropical is a little bit rare. It on average occurs in about four days in a given summer. Many years it doesn't occur at all. Other years it can occur 15, 20 percent. So again, this is highly variable. And although we have one bad year, about 2013, where there was over 30 percent of the days that were dry tropical, we see no trend in the dry tropical air mass. It's basically a flat line. So we do have a frequency in MT plus air masses, no frequency in change in, in dry tropical, but the overall frequency of these two air masses, both of which are very dangerous to human health, is obviously upward if you add them together. And again, just to make sure you understand, the dry tropical days are probably the ones that are the hottest in Des Moines in the summer where temperatures exceed 100 degrees. Uh, the moist tropical plus often don't exceed 100 degrees, but they have much higher humidity, or dew point as we call it. And so uh, therefore, that's a very dangerous air mass as well, even though it's not quite as hot as the dry tropical. It is hot and humid, and humidity can also create a problem for human well-being because during humid conditions, sweat doesn't evaporate from the body efficiently, and you have a condition where the human body does not cool off efficiently. So in any case, let me stop for a second here and see if there are any questions on this, on this particular pair of graphs before we move on. I want to make sure everyone is with me at this point. Are there any questions? I guess my question is what, um, what observations are you using? Are you just the Des Moines Airport or? Yeah, we use 24 hour uh, observations a day from Des Moines Airport. That is correct. Uh, but we've done this for 300 plus stations around the country. I'm kind of glad you asked that question. We have done this type of evaluation of frequency and character for five other Midwestern cities. We've done it for Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, using Minneapolis Airport. We've done it for St. Louis. We've done it for Detroit, Chicago, and Cincinnati. And all of them are showing a general increase, sometimes even more impressive than the Des Moines increases. They're all showing increases in frequency. So yes, we only use one airport, but remember that an air mass is what we call a macro scale feature. So if there's an MT plus air mass at Des Moines Airport, there's an MT plus air mass in all of Polk County in 99.9% .9 of the cases. It would only be different if there was a cold front happened to be draped right across Polk County and maybe the northwest side was in a different air mass. But we're looking at large-scale features because air masses can cover thousands of square miles. Did you, did you see a, the same trend with Waterloo? Because I know you guys do this for Waterloo as well. We didn't do it for Waterloo. Well, as I said, we did it for Minneapolis, St. Paul, which is probably the closest station to you that we did it for. So uh, I am assuming that the trends will be similar. Uh, it might be a good exercise to do Waterloo, but we did not do this for Waterloo thus far. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Uh, okay, so let's go to the next slide. Larry, I'm sorry. We have, we have one more. So if, I'm sorry, if, sure. If you didn't do it for Waterloo, we forecast for Waterloo as well. So the Waterloo would be older data that we're using for, for the system? Uh, we have not yet updated. We, we did not remember the data that we used for this frequency evaluation. We have the same data for Waterloo. The updating is only on the heat health part, and we haven't gotten to that yet. The updating is only on evaluating how mortality response has been different. So no, we have not done that yet for Waterloo, and we will need to do that. But 
we that's the second part of the project as, as far as we're concerned. Right now, everything you see is just for Des Moines. I do recognize that you forecast for Waterloo as well, um, and we will need to update that. But, but we haven't even updated the Des Moines heat health warning system yet. We just have the results for Des Moines, and I'm going to give you some suggestions on how we should update it when we get to the heat health warning part. As far as this meteorological data go, we have the same meteorological data for Waterloo. We could do these same frequency analyses for Waterloo uh, if we want immediately. Okay, thank you, Larry. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, so let's move to the next slide. Um, obviously, if the hot, uncomfortable air masses are going up in frequency, we only have 100% of days, other air masses have to be going down. And sure enough, the two that were going down most steeply are the two polar air masses, the dry polar, or DP, which is the cool, comfortable air mass that you have in central Iowa after a cold front has passed, or the moist polar air mass, which is a cloudy, often associated with rainy situation or with cyclonic conditions uh, in, in Iowa. Uh, both of these are the coolest air masses that you get in the summer, uh, one being cool and dry, the other being cool and moist. And both of these air masses have been going down in frequency at a statistically significant manner. As a matter of fact, the last four years, there's been no MP air in the summer in Des Moines at all, as you can see by those four dots um, uh, at the zero line, and very little over the last few years. And for DP as well, we did not have a single year where there was no DP air in the summer up until about 2008. I don't know if that's 2008 or 2009. And since then, we've had three. So both of these comfortable air masses are going down in frequency, and they have to because something has to go down. Uh, these were the two that were going down in a statistically significant fashion. So the number of cool, comfortable days is reducing in this area. Now, again, I am not going to make a statement that this is due to human-induced global warming. It may be. I'm not saying it isn't. But there's nothing in this study to prove that it either is or is not. I'm just here to show you the trends, and I'm not here, again, to argue anthropogenic global warming. I'm just telling you that the hot, humid air masses are becoming more frequent, and the cool air masses are becoming less frequent whether it's a natural, non-human phenomena or a human phenomena, is really not germane to me, other than the fact that we'd like to know what might happen in the future. It's just to let you know that the air masses that cause human health conditions or negative human health outcomes are becoming more frequent uh, in, in the Des Moines and Polk County area. Next slide. There's one more category that I want to point out to you, and this is MT++, or Moist Tropical++. These are the worst of the worst hot, humid days. Uh, MT++ is defined as MT days where both the temperature and the dew point, that is the thermal and the moisture characteristics, are more than one standard deviation above the average MT. And during the period of 1945 to the present, there have been 26 total MT++ days through this period. And you can see we didn't fit a line here, but it clearly shows that the frequency is going up. The majority of the years, there are no MT++ days, as you can see on the line, the bottom line, the zero line with all those dots. But what is noteworthy to us is that in the last three out of four years, we've had eight MT++ days. That's uh, 8 over 26 is 30% of the total over a 70-year period have occurred in the last three years. And uh, we, you could see that one year, which I believe is 2012, there were five of those days. This is not in percent. This is in actual days. There were five of those days that occurred in the summer. Now, one thing, of course, some of you are meteorologists, some of you are not, that you need to know is that weather occurs in cycles. And what happens here is that the high-frequency years often are in consecutive year clumps. So you can see that in around the early 1980s, there were two bad years in a row. 
Uh, then uh, around 1998 or so, there were three years where there were some. And then, of course, more recently there were some. And then you have long strings of years, sometimes up to 10 years, where you have none at all. So the thing about these worst and most uncomfortable days that are associated often with high human mortality is that they occur irregularly, but in sometimes multi-year periods, consecutive multi-year periods, and I might tell you also multi-day periods within those years. So they're often not randomly scattered. They occur together, and of course that's the most dangerous thing in terms of human health. If you have two or three of these days occurring within a week, which sometimes can happen, you have a very, very dangerous situation. So I wanted to point out to you that the frequency of this MT++, which is rare, I mean, it occurs on average 26 out of 70 years, uh, once every two and a half years on average. 30% of them have occurred in the last four years, even though you can see in 2014 there were none of them, but there were in the three years prior. And so this very dangerous air mass is going up in frequency. Next slide. So what are the implications of our findings? The frequency of oppressive air masses is increasing, but only for the moist tropical plus and plus plus. We found no change in dry tropical. The frequency of cool, comfortable air masses is decreasing significantly over the last 65 to 70 years. And the highly oppressive MT++ air mass is increasing with over 30% of all days occurring during the last four years within this 60 to 5 plus year evaluation. Are there any questions? Let me stop again and see if there are any questions up to this point. Okay, Jeff, I'm going to move on. Is that okay with you? That is perfectly fine. Go ahead, Larry. Okay, Jeff, let's go to the next slide. Now I wanted to look at the character evaluation. Uh, in the other five Midwestern cities, we saw some increases in temperature and in dew point that were rather noteworthy, and we wanted to see if the same thing was occurring in Des Moines. And to be quite honest, we didn't find important thermal character changes. So here you are looking at the temperature, the, the maximum temperature changes that have occurred over this period for MT plus and DT. And although we do see a weak increase in MT plus, where it's increased about a degree and a half or two degrees uh, over the past 65 to 70 years, that was a non-statistically significant increase because of the large scatter around it. The DT maximum temperatures actually decreased slightly, also non-statistically significantly. So it's it is bad that the frequency is increasing for the MT plus, but we did not see the temperature increase. And I must say, uh, this is unusual. We saw this in the other Midwestern cities. We did not see this uh, in Polk County or at the Des Moines airport. If we go to the next slide on minimum temperature, we actually see decreases uh, in temperature, which was very surprising to us. We certainly found this in none of the Midwestern cities uh, that we looked at. Uh, and we thought this was a rather unusual result. But there does seem to be an increase in variability. If you look for the MT plus minimum temperatures in the beginning of the period, there's not much change from year to year. But if you go to the end of the period, there is a lot of change. So the warm years seem to have about the same minimum temperature for MT plus, but there are a number of cooler years. I talked to Jeff about this. We had a conversation about a week ago. And we were wondering whether there has been equipment movement at the Des Moines Airport uh, weather station of the equipment that might have caused this. And um, I think Jeff told me he might take a look into this. But that's one possible explanation as to why this is happening. So we did not see what we expected to see for either maximum and minimum temperature here. But nevertheless, I don't want you to be fooled or lulled into thinking that these air masses are getting comfortable. You can see that the minimum temperatures still hover well over 70 degrees in most years, especially for the uh, MT+. Uh, by the way, if we go back one slide, uh, you can see the temperature. If you go to the maximum temperatures, you can see the average DT maximum temperatures are 96, 98, and sometimes over 100. 
The MT maximum temperatures are cooler than that, uh, as I had told you before. But if you look at the minimum temperatures, go forward again, Jeff. You could see that the MT plus minimum temperatures uh, are not lower than the DT minimum temperatures. They're, if anything, a little bit higher or maybe close to the same. Uh, so, uh, and of course, the dew points are higher for MT minimum. So, to be quite honest, we didn't expect this result. Um, these slopes are not statistically significant, but on the other hand, they do exist, and I wanted to report them to you. However, if you go to the next slide, we do see something important, and it is statistically significant. There has been an increase in the dew point of MT air, that is, a measure of the humidity of the MT air. Uh, for those of you who don't know it, the dew point is the point or the temperature uh, where if you drop the air temperature to the dew point, you would reach 100% relative humidity. Uh, air temperature can never be cooler than the dew point, but it can be equal to the dew point. And uh, you could see here that the average dew point, which does measure the moisture content of the air, has increased in statistically significant fashion, um, increasing by about 1.2 degrees for the MT plus air mass. For DT, we see a straight line where things are rather constant, and it hasn't changed much. By the way, look at the dew point differences between MT plus and DT. You can see they generally average in the low 70s for MT plus, but in the low to mid 60s for DT. And that's what renders MT plus very dangerous, even though it's slightly cooler than DT. The fact that what we call the heat index, or the apparent temperature of the MT plus air mass, is very, very high because apparent temperature or heat index combines both the way the temperature and the humidity feel together, and clearly there's a, a significantly higher dew point for MT+. So in any case, we are concerned that the dew point has been increasing for MT+, during the period of record, and it has increased at a fairly substantial manner. If you go to the next slide, we took the worst MT plus day each summer season, that is the day that had the highest mean dew point, a single day for each year, and we looked at this worst day to see what has happened to its character in terms of dew point. And sure enough, we have a, quite a steep slope here in terms of increasing dew point, where today the worst day averages almost a 75 degree dew point which is very, very high, as opposed to slightly over a 72 degree dew point at the beginning of the period. This relationship is highly statistically significant, and the average dew point increase on the worst day through the 65 plus year period has been 2.1 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's gone up rather significantly during this period of time. And therefore, you could see that even though we didn't get any maximum temperature increase during this period of time, we do have a maximum dew point, and the, a dew point increase that is rather substantial. Are there any questions on these temperature and dew point findings that you'd like to raise? None here, Larry. Okay, very good. Now let's go to the next slide, which is the implications of all of this. There aren't very many important changes in the thermal character of offensive air masses in Des Moines since the mid-1940s. However, there are important moist tropical plus dew point increases that have occurred throughout this period, particularly during the most oppressive MT plus days. So this would contribute to an increased oppressive nature of MT plus in more recent years because it has increased the heat index of that particular air mass in the more recent years. And so although the thermal characteristics did not come out impressively, especially for minimum temperature, uh, we are still concerned about the nature of these air masses because the MT plus, which is already hot and humid, is becoming more humid throughout this period of time. Uh, so now you know that the frequencies are going up of the MT plus air mass, not for the DT, but the MT plus occurs more frequently and the dew point is going up as well, uh, and both of these are, are, are rather dangerous indicators about what's been going on in terms of the worst air masses or the, the health debilitating air masses that are present in Polk County during this period of time. 
Now, again, I, as someone had asked before, I did not do Waterloo. I think we could do Waterloo rather quickly, and um, I would expect that the results would not be very different from Des Moines, but it would be instructive to do it. Now, not every day in Waterloo is under the same air mass as in Des Moines, but the vast majority would be, because, again, uh, these are large-scale air mass uh, areas uh, and air mass can and usually does take up a large piece of real estate at any given time. Um, I always tell my students that you can consider an air mass something of a, a bell jar of air. Uh, uh, everything underneath it is a rather homogeneous situation over a fairly large and substantial area, including, by the way, air quality. Uh, and some of these air masses that are hot and humid. Uh, also occurred during very low air quality days because the thermodynamics of these air masses create a situation where air quality is also generally low. So that concludes our discussion of the frequency and character changes of the worst air masses. And now let's go to the next slide. And I would like to go into what all this means and what we're using some of this information for in terms of the heat health warning system that is presently operated uh, on the web uh, and used by the National Weather Service Office in Des Moines as guidance to, to help them determine when is the best time to call excessive heat warnings and uh, heat advisories. So again, the Des Moines Weather Forecast Office uses it as guidance. They are not obliged to use the warning system exclusively. Uh, they have other judgments that they use to call advisories and warnings, but the warning system that we've developed is one of their primary guidance tools that they do use. The thing about the system that is different from other warning system criteria is that it is not just based on meteorological factors. It is actually based on heat health relationships in the area. Uh, when we first did this project with uh, Polk County Health, uh, we developed a system that is based on identifying days when mortality was above average because of excessive heat. And we have gained data from the National Center for Health Statistics of everyone who has died in, in all through the United States, but in this case uh, for Polk County and the surrounding area and also for Waterloo area, everyone who has died daily through this period of record of 1975 to 2004 and now up through 2010. So we can identify which kinds of air masses contribute to higher mean mortalities, and of course they would be attributed to the heat. And the other thing about the system is that it provides guidance up to five days out. Uh, the National Weather Service Forecast Office issues what are called point forecast matrices, and these are small areas where they have pinpoint forecasts that actually uh, estimate hourly temperatures and other meteorological variables, including dew point, for a small area. We took the point forecast matrix for Des Moines Airport, and we are able to determine using their forecast data, which actually go out seven days, uh, we use this for five days, to determine what the air mass type is going to be from one, two, three, four, five days in advance based upon their forecasts. And by the way, the forecast office can update their forecast any time, but they do update it for sure twice daily. And I want to go to the next slide and show you what our website presently looks like. Uh, I wanted to pick one where we've had warnings called. So this one happens to be for Dallas-Fort Worth, but the website for Des Moines and Waterloo look exactly the same as this. Uh, the data are different, of course. The criteria are different. Uh, one of the things is every city reacts differently to heat and health. So you can't use the same criteria over large areas. That's something the Weather Service had done in the past, and I think uh, they've been pretty well convinced that that is not the way to go because people react differently to heat in different places. Often they are less sensitive to heat as you move south toward the Gulf Coast. And I live down here on Marco Island, Florida. No one dies of the heat down here. Um, as a matter of fact, the highest temperature I've recorded, I live about half a mile from the beach, the highest temperature I've recorded in southwest Florida is 93 degrees over the last 12 years I live here, uh, which always makes me laugh because it's probably one of the lowest high temperatures of virtually anywhere in the United States. 
Um, what's interesting about this is that as you move south through the United States, weather variability diminishes. And it's not just the intensity of the heat. Summer weather variability is very important. So think about what your weather is like in the summer in Des Moines. Um, you know, you may have days where the high is in the 80 and the low is in the 60s and 80s and 60s, and this is the average condition. And then all of a sudden you get one of those dry tropical or moist tropical plus air mass sieges, and for five consecutive days the temperature is hovering in the upper 90s to near 100, and the dew points are in the 70s. That's what kills people, that high variability from the average condition. Where I live here in Marco Island, Every day in the summer is almost exactly the same. We often don't reach 90 degrees. We usually have around 89, 88, 90. Temperatures overnight are in the mid-70s. It's the same virtually every day. Some days we get a thunderstorm. Some days we don't. But people respond to high heat variability. So the most vulnerable areas for heat-related negative health outcomes are generally in the northeastern and midwestern United States, as well as the Pacific Coast, from Seattle down to L.A. Yes, Seattle has a significant number of heat-related deaths, and our system is used by the Seattle Weather Forecast Office. They never used to call warnings. Since people in Seattle don't have air conditioning, they're not adjusted to heat, even a day of 90 degrees in Seattle can kill a lot of people. A day in Des Moines, which would be, you'd brush it off as nothing. Uh, think of Phoenix. Uh, you know, the conditions are much different in Phoenix. If they had a 100-degree day in Phoenix, that's a walk in the park. <clears throat> the population is adjusted to that situation. So you need to develop a web page like this for every single city that we work with. Even if the weather is the same, the demographics could be different. We have some cities that have a high number of elderly people. Uh, elderly people are more vulnerable to the heat, the vagaries of heat, than younger people are. So in cities like Philadelphia, which have a high percentage of elderly population, we have a very vulnerable city to heat-related mortality. So all of these things are taken into effect when you look at this particular page. And let me show you how to read this. Um, Basically, you could see several different things here. The date is in the upper left-hand corner of each bar. There's your five-day warning period. This forecast was issued for Dallas-Fort Worth on August 4, 2009 at 4.20 p.m. And usually the National forecast, Weather Forecast Offices issue their forecasts for the PFMs um, twice a day at 4 a.m. and 4 p.m., somewhere around there, and they can always update it if they see that their forecast is off. They can modify by raising or lowering the temperatures at any given time. And what you see is 9Z, 15Z, 21Z, and 3Z. Those are the times in, in Greenwich Mean Time, uh, and the numbers below them where it says 80 slash 69, that is the temperature and the dew point that has been forecast for August 5th, on the 4th, by the National Weather for Service office in Dallas-Fort Worth. And you can see that when you get into the afternoon, which is 21Z, for that particular day they're forecasting a temperature of 103 for a high and a dew point of 64 at that particular point. And then you see for August 6th, their forecast, also a very hot day. But then August 7th, 8th, and 9th are cooler. And by the way, for Dallas-Fort Worth, having a day in the mid-90s is not a big deal. So those are rather normal days, and no advisories would be issued. In the upper right-hand corner is the air mass type. And you can see dry tropical, or DT, dry tropical, moist tropical, not moist tropical plus, which is a uh, offensive air mass. Moist tropical is not. Moist tropical, moist tropical. And then there's a consecutive day counter where you see three in parentheses and four. And then when you get out of the two offensive air mass days, the counter starts going back down again. And then we have a special formula for Dallas-Fort Worth, just like we do for Polk County, that estimates the number of deaths. And, of course, this is a password-protected website. You can see that for August 5th, our system estimated that three people will die of the heat on that particular day, and on August 6th, Four people will die from the heat. Uh, we've actually done evaluation studies on this, and 
you know, we can't, obviously, there are so many other things that people die from that you can't forecast precisely how many people are going to die, but I think we do pretty well in forecasting when deaths are going to be above average or below average. And so these are used as guidance because three deaths, extra deaths, is enough to issue a warning, an excessive heat warning for Dallas-Fort Worth on the 5th. Now, on the 6th, a heat watch is issued. Uh, the definition, forecast office definition for a heat watch is dangerous conditions beyond 24 hours, between 24 and 48 hours. And since we're over 24 hours away, a watch is issued for the next day. And then for the 7th, 8th, and 9th, there's no advisory at all. You can see the definitions uh, for the excessive heat warning advisory watch. An advisory is a lower level than a warning within 24 hours. It's still not comfortable and fairly dangerous, but the health department would not necessarily take a lot of actions on an advisory day. It certainly would on an excessive heat warning day. Heat watches between 24 to 48 out, uh, hours out, and if we see offensive air masses beyond 48 hours, you get that brown bar, which would be a heat outlook. And if we would have had that on August 7th, 8th, and 9th, you would have seen those bars being brown. But obviously that did not happen in this group of days. Are there any questions? This is, as I said, a password-protected website, and it's updated all the time. I'll explain that in a second as to how it's updated. But uh, every time the National Weather Service Forecast Office issues a new forecast, this system automatically updates based on what the response is to the heat and whether there's an offensive air mass being forecast or whatever. Any questions? Yeah, I had a question on the, the overnight lows. Do you, do you, does this thing take into account, um, you know, if it's above a certain temperature for several days? Absolutely. There's a consecutive day counter in there. So that's what you see in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, that counter is, and it isn't based on overnight lows alone. It's based on the presence of the offensive air mass. Now, overnight lows still can factor into this because um, the algorithm, for the, once we have the dangerous air masses identified, we develop an algorithm that finds all the statistically significant possibilities there. And you could have overnight lows important at that particular point. But uh, there are a number of weather elements and the consecutive day element. There's even a time of season element that's included in this. Um, we find that heat waves often early in the season are more dangerous than heat waves later in the season. So for some cities, uh, conditions that would call for an excessive heat warning may occur in May and June. Those same conditions could occur in August, and a heat warning would not be called. So all of those things are taken into account when you see that warning thing. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you, Larry. You're welcome. Any other questions? If I remember this year, it's either this year or the recent years, we had uh, relatively cool temperatures to start out the warm season and then it got really warm late, which was climato climatologically when it often occurs, but for that particular season, it hadn't happened yet. Does the system take that into account? Um, actually, the system counts from day one, uh, and day one is usually May 1st uh, in the summer season and goes on from there. So what would happen is that uh, at this particular point, we have, you know, you, you – how do I put this? There's a point where the level of sophistication is too great to really make it applicable. And so to isolate those years where there were just late season heat waves, let's say the first heat wave was in August, basically all August days are treated the same. So I guess I'm going to have to say no as an answer to that question. But nevertheless, it has not really affected the overall accuracy because usually, although there will be certain years, a minority of years, where June and July will be cool and then suddenly August will be hot, you're almost always going to get at least one bit of hot weather in June and July to set things off. And, uh, you know, you would get the more likely heat warnings called then. Uh, we've talked about adding that to the system and actually did an experiment for a couple of cities, and we deemed that the effort involved in doing that was not worth the added gain and benefit. So, again, to keep it relatively simple while making it better than what we have now, 
We decided not to do that, but it's always something that we can revisit because I'm sure there are certain years where the first heat wave happened on August 18th, and yet our system would consider that a regular August day and not consider it like a June day. So it's a good point you raise. I've got to say the system does not take that into account right now. Uh, we don't necessarily think we need to, but it's something we can always revisit. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, let's go to the next slide. So what is the, quote, algorithm that we use for Des Moines? We found that day and sequence is by far the most important issue when it comes to heat-related mortality for Des Moines. And you see that we get generally, not completely, increases in mortality as you move through the day in sequence. Now, for MT+, plus, the first day doesn't seem to cause much of a problem. The second and especially third day do. And then, in this particular case, we found that for MT+, plus, if you have the fourth and fifth consecutive day, uh, you've killed off some of the susceptibles, and you don't see quite, and this is based, remember, on 1975 to 2004 data, you don't see quite the increase that you saw on the first, second, and third day. For DT, we found a high number on the first day, lower on the second, and then high numbers of deaths, which are up to 10% above the baseline. So each of those numbers is saying, for example, the fifth consecutive DT day means that on average, on a fifth consecutive DT day, the mortality increases by 10%, and that's all-cause mortality. So that's a, a pretty important figure. And so based on these numbers, and this again is from 1975 to 2004, this is what the system is running on right now, the yellow means uh, that we would, have the, we would guide the weather service to call an advisory on those days. Clear means nothing, so on the first MT plus day, nothing would be called. And the red would be excessive heat warning days. So from the third consecutive day on for MT+, plus, and for the second consecutive day on for DT, we would recommend a warning. Now, using these criteria, in an average summer, 2.2 days would have a warning. Now, of course, you can't have a two-tenths of a day, but this is averaging the whole period. So a little over two days a summer season, the system would advise for a warning. And 4.7 days, it would call for an advisory, which is the lower level. Uh, so these are important numbers. They vary from year to year. There are some years where there is no warning to be called. There are other years where there are more warnings to be called based upon what we have. But basically, this is during an average year. Based on what we found is a day and sequence significant variable, uh, this is how the system would basically work. So if you go to the next slide, I'll show you exactly how the system works here. There's forecast data that comes from the point forecast matrix for Des Moines Airport and for Waterloo that the National Weather Service creates for us. We then put the day into the air mass or spatial synoptic class. And we use something called the spatial synoptic classification. If you're interested to know how we put each day in an air mass, I'll be glad to direct you to the literature. But each day is then put into an air mass class. And we have a weather type forecast. If it is not a DT or MT plus, it is considered a not offensive day. No watch warning is issued. The system looks for an updated forecast and starts all over again. And by the way, the system is looking for a forecast every 15 minutes. So every 15 minutes, uh, in automated fashion, this procedure is gone through. If it is a DT or MT plus day, we use the forecast algorithm, which was the slide before. If the forecast algorithm calls for excess mortality of significant amount, we go and have a watch warning or watch or warning or advisory issued. Or if it does not, nothing is issued, no watch warning, and we have an updated forecast. In any case, we go through these steps. The system does this every 15 minutes, goes through this loop, and checks to see whether or not, based on the criteria for Des Moines, and I might add for every other city we do this for, 
whether or not an advisory or a warning or a watch be issued. If it does call for a watch or a warning, the weather forecast office communicates it to the local authorities, whether it be the health department, which also has access to the password protected website, or to other utilities, uh, civil defense, whoever it happens to be that would find this information important. That is to any of the stakeholders who take intervention measures to make sure that they can lessen mortality. So that's the way the system works. And let me stop again and see if there are any questions that you might have. No questions here, Larry. OK, again, we call the advisories and warnings based upon increases in mortality through the historical period. So now, the final part of this briefing is to determine if things have changed in Polk County uh, now that we have added the six new years of mortality data. And let's go to the next slide to look at this. So first of all, we have a table on the right-hand side. We see day and sequence across the top, and we see three periods here. The period of 1975 to 2010, which is the new study. The period of 1975 to 2004, which is what the old system, or the present, actually the present system is based on. And the period from 2000 to 2010, which is the most recent period. And we were concerned that this is too short a period to really get meaningful results. And in many cases, we found that to be the case. Uh, because the numbers that you see now, the yellow and the red numbers, are conditions where we have significant increases in mortality. So let me show you how you would read that. Let's say for 1975 to 2004, uh, the fifth consecutive day number of 1.059 means that for Moist Tropical Plus, we are expecting a little over one excess death on average on the fifth consecutive day. Now, that may not sound like a lot to you, but in Polk County, there is an average of about a little over 10 deaths a day. So if you increase it by a little over one, you've increased it 10%. That is, for all those MT Plus days, you have increased mortality by 10%. Certainly, that's noteworthy. For the third consecutive day, we have a .376, or a little over a third of a death a day on average. That's a 3.7% increase, approximately. That's also statistically significant. And so those numbers may seem small to you. Remember that not every third day has this number. Some third days can have five extra deaths. Others can have none. We have to figure out which ones are the ones that are going to have the worst ones. But basically, you see that they are above normal for all of the consecutive day counts for the 1975 to 2010 and 1975 to 2004 period. The good news in this chart is that when you add the extra six years, the response has gotten weaker. That is that the number of deaths attributed to heat over the last six years appears to have gone down, which to us is very, very good news. The frequency of these air masses hasn't gone down, as I've shown you before, but the number of extra deaths on the days when these air masses occur, on average, appears to have gone down. Now, we are attributing this decline to better public awareness of heat as a problem, the Weather Forecast Office and Polk County Public Health, along with other stakeholders, have done a lot to inform the population that heat is a danger. Uh, 20 years ago, most people didn't consider heat a danger. Now many people are aware that it is, and so there have been advi you know, advice is issued, interventions occur, and there are ways that people can now adjust to heat because they know that a certain day is going to be bad. They know they should drink a lot of fluids thanks to uh, what has been put out by Polk County Health. They know they should stay in air conditioning. They know they should be doing certain behaviors which they used to ignore 20 or 30 years ago. And we have found this in questionnaire studies that people still don't believe heat is that important to them, which is a mistake. But they are more aware today that it is important to them than they were 20 to 30 years ago. Uh, also, the National Weather Service has issued more accurate forecasts. 
So what has happened over the years is that days which are identified as excessively hot days, days when mornings should be called, hopefully partially to our system too, have now been better identified. And so the days where we have problems are now pinpointed in better fashion. There are less false alarms, what we call false negatives and false positives. So between increased awareness, better interventions, for example, now in many communities, I don't know if this happens in Polk County, and maybe my friends there can tell me, in many communities we work with, the local utility will not cut off someone's power for non-payment during a day when the National Weather Service calls an excessive heat warning. They used to do that all the time, so people wouldn't pay their bill or couldn't pay their bill, and on the worst days, suddenly would, someone would cut off their utilities, water or electric, or air conditioning. Well, that's certainly not a thing to do. So today, in many communities, they will not cut off utility to a home for non-payment, or what they, they, will not, they will suspend disconnects, and they will connect them again during these days. And I don't know if that happens in your county or not, but it happens in many others. And, and so, uh, you know, police, fire, even faith-based groups, in some cases people go door-to-door -door in communities. They have, uh, uh, they have buddy systems in Philadelphia where community people go door-to-door. -door. They know an 80-year-old woman lives in an apartment building. They check up on her. Uh, there are many things that are done today that we think have led to the decline in heat-related mortality. And so we think combinations of all of these things have led to a decline. Now, this is for MT+. Plus. We go to the next slide. We see that DT does not have, as I told you this before, a much of a consecutive day trend. And there are the values for the 1975 to 2010 and 1975 to 2004. Here, the difference is much smaller. Basically, people respond to DT in negative fashion somewhat the same today, maybe slightly less with the added six years than they did before, but the numbers are fairly high all through the period. Uh, almost every DT day seems to cause an increase in mortality, or a very large number of them, up to 9 to 10 percent. You could see for two consecutive days at something in the order of 13 percent, uh, and in the 1975 to 2010 for two consecutive days, it's a, a little less than 10 percent. But nevertheless, we see high increases, not as much of a change, but DT has to be considered a threat throughout its range. We see high mortality occurring from the first day on for DT. Let's go to the next slide. This time we came up with a mortality algorithm for MT plus that was significant, almost highly statistically significant. It was statistically significant, which is at the point, probability at the 0.05 level. Here we have probability at the 0.01 level for the period 1975 to 2010. So we now have an algorithm for mortality that includes afternoon apparent temperature or heat index, uh, where if the temperature is uh, at a certain level at 3 p.m., uh, there could be a call of a warning. The algorithm has a one-day lag. That means that if the weather occurs on Tuesday, the warning would be called on Wednesday. Let me show you how this algorithm works. Let's say the apparent temperature is uh, 100 degrees for a given day, where it says 1,500 AT, you'd add for the AT, you'd put in 100 for that level. You would basically get no increase at 100 degrees. If you put in 105 degrees at that AT, you get a 4% increase in mortality. If you put in 110 degrees, you get a 7.5% increase. So that's the way this algorithm works, uh, where along with a consecutive day issue for MT+, you now have actual uh, an apparent temperature or heat index factor as well that we've put in there. By the way, we found nothing for 2000 to 2010. It's too short a period. We found no statistically significant algorithm for the DT air mass, but we didn't need one. If you go back one slide, all you need to do is look at the day in sequence, and you can see that virtually all the DT days represent a problem. Luckily, DT doesn't happen very often, uh, you know, usually less than 5% in the summer, but you see statistically significant increases no matter what. We'll go now to the next slide 
which is MT++ mortality results. Now, as I told you, there were 26 MT++ days during this period, and the MT++ data were included in the MT++ that I showed you before, but we decided to isolate every MT++ day through the period of record that we had mortality data, which was 1975 to 2010. Uh, we couldn't use any of those MT++ days from 1945 to 1974 because we didn't have mortality data. So here are the MT++ days, of which there were 12, from 1975 to 2010. For example, June 27, 1980 was an MT++ day. July 7, 1980, notice there were four in 1980 and three of these occurred within a four or five day period. And that's what happens, and this is what I was trying to tell you before, that it occurs in clumps. Then we had two days in 1981. So 1980 to 1981 had six MT++ days out of the 26 throughout, those two years. Then we went through 14 years without a single MT++ day. And then we had two in 1995. One in 1998, one in 1999, one in 2001. Then we went nine years to 2010, and I told you there have been eight in the last four years, but unfortunately we don't have the mortality data for those last four years. So we're only evaluating mortality for the 1975 to 2010. We have to wait for the National Center for Health Statistics to get the mortality data digitized for the last four or five years. They usually run on a four-year lag. So we were just happy to get up to 2010. So these were the 12 MT++ days. Under MORT, that is the estimate of the variation in mortality on those days. The first two days, we didn't have any excess mortality estimated. The numbers were negative. But you will notice that out of these 12 days, only three days had negative mortality. And the others generally had high numbers. Remember we said that if you're getting an 8 9% increase in mortality, that's a lot. Well, how about a 51% increase? On July 13, 1981, that MT++ day said that there were 5.14 on, based on the algorithm, excess deaths, based upon the algorithm. That's, since only 10 people die on average in Des Moines, that's over 50%. How about July 13th, 1995? We have a 6.3 increase in mortality. It's a 63% increase on that day. The point is that most of these days, 9 out of 12 showed a positive number in terms of mortality. 7 of them showed over a 10%. Those are the darkened ones. And 5 of them, almost half of them, showed over a 30% increase in mortality. So even though MT++ is rare, and even though there could be a couple of days where it will not be above average, and again, remember, other things affect mortality beside weather. I mean, just by sheer happenstance, it might have been a day where less people died. Uh, so, you know, there are other things besides weather that affect mortality, which is why you don't get high numbers every day. But certainly, the MT++ stands out as a very important air mass with five of the 12 days showing a 30% or more increase, and seven of the 12 days showing over a 10% increase, and nine of the 12 days showing an increase of some kind. So we now have decided that MT++ has to be considered as something separate and deliberate in terms of any future warning system. Let me stop here for a second before I go to my recommendations based upon these results. Are there any questions that any of you have? I know this is a lot to swallow, and I appreciate your hanging in with me. I guess I wonder, on some of these MT++, are they really only impacting um, the people susceptible to death, or are they impacting, like, that we also take into account all the other people that need to... Um, be out there, the people outside playing sports, things like that, I guess the, the overall impact of the population, or is it really just specifically um, the elderly or people not getting, vulnerable. yeah, the vulnerable population? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. We use total mortality data for these statistics, so this is everyone, 
what you're seeing here. Now, we have, we have not yet divided this up, and I don't even know if we're going to do this. It's something I'll have to talk to Polk County Health about. We have not divided these up by the demographic groups like we've been doing for L.A. County Public Health and like we've done for other cities. That is, in their case, we've actually looked at racial breakdowns, we've looked at age breakdowns, and we've looked at the two gender breakdowns as well. We have not done that for Polk County. Uh, based on what we've done for other cities, I would guess that many of these people are more susceptible, but not all of them. Uh, there are, and by the way, we don't know the names of the people who died. The data that we have uh, are just the counts countywide and then based on their age and so on. So we don't know what the person was doing at the time they, were, they had died. We just have a primary and secondary cause of death. And it doesn't say, well, this person was playing tennis at the time they died or whatever. So we don't know that one of these deaths may be Mary Jones, who lived by herself, and she was 85 years old in an apartment building. We don't have that kind of detail. But uh, we can do a better job of this. And, of course, that could be something we can consider in the future, where we break this down by demographic group. Uh, generally, again, it's the 65 and older group and usually the one-year-old or less group that are the most susceptible. We actually even have a newborn category in the data, which is one month or less that we could look at. So uh, we know uh, that we can do that. Uh, we've also found in L.A. County, we have found a very strong racial disparity in heat-related mortality um, that's probably not due to the physical differences in race, but due instead to the fact that, um, uh, you know, maybe the poor classes might be certain races like Hispanic and African American, while Asian and Caucasian would be um, generally, of course this is a generalization, more well off. So we see African American and Hispanic rates much higher than for the other areas, and L.A. County is going to give us 14 neighborhood data from 14 neighborhoods, and we are going to pinpoint the actual neighborhoods there and our next contract with them uh, that, are, uh, that are the most vulnerable. Uh, we have not refined that in this degree for Polk County Public Health. So although I would venture a guess that many are elderly and susceptible and some may be young, there are certainly, uh, uh, this goes for total mortality, and so there are certainly others in here that are also vulnerable. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, so now what do we do with all of this information? Uh, we know what's happening to the frequencies of these air masses. We know how people in Polk County generally respond to the air masses. So let's go to the next slide. Although the mortality response to heat has diminished, we contend that it is important to maintain a sophisticated heat health warning system like the one we have to warm when conditions are favorable for negative health outcomes. Um, we really do believe that uh, any, you know, patting ourselves on the back at this point is not the way to go. We've seen this in other cities too, and you have to realize I've worked with innumerable health departments now, and we all know that we've got to keep our system up to date and use the most recent data that we have to understand the responses. MT plus and MT plus plus air masses are very important triggers to increased health risk. Although DT shows no consecutive day trend, we see that it contributes to higher mortality across the board. So when you add it all up, where do we go from here? And this is uh, what I talked about with uh, uh, public health in Polk County and also with uh, Jeff's office in terms of where I think we should go. Uh, both I and Polk County Health believe the heat health warning system should be updated and it can be improved based on the added results. One way of doing this is to include our new MT plus algorithm. And as I said, uh, not only do we know consecutive days are important for MT+, plus, we now know, based on the new data, that we have about a 4% increase in mortality on average at 105 degree heat index and a 7.5% increase at 110 based on that algorithm. We think the algorithm should be incorporated into the heat warning system, which it is not now because it's based on the new data. 
We will include DT in a manner yet to be determined, although I think virtually the vast majority of DT days should have at least an advisory issued and certainly a warning. And I think this is something we need to discuss. Um, I have no recommendation as of yet. I want to hear what Polk County Health and the National Weather Service Office thinks about what I just showed. And we are going to make a decision on how to incorporate DT and whether it should be different than what we have, had, we have done thus far. So uh, we probably will make some changes based upon the new results, but we need to discuss that. And, of course, any stakeholders are welcome to give their uh, advice on this. Also important is we will include, and this is a very important recommendation that I want to make, I think all MT++ days, whenever they are forecast, should be an immediate excessive heat warning. As soon as one is seen, it's got to be called. Now, remember, that's not very many. There have been 26 in the last 70, some, 70 years or 65 years. But there have been more, they've been slightly more frequent now. They occur in groupings, as you saw, like 1980 and 81, um, recently, and so on. I, even though there were a couple of days when there was no excess mortality that had occurred at that, on those days, I think they have to be all called excessive heat warnings because almost half of them had a 30% increase in mortality, and seven of them, more, well more than half, had a 10% or greater increase. So my recommendation is that all MT++ days, when we redo our heat warning system and that flow chart, every MT++ day should be called a warning. Again, this is not cast in stone. I am not here to impose my suggestions are you, on you. I was called to make suggestions. That why, that's why this study was undertaken. Uh, I am here to discuss this with all of you. And I think it should be a joint decision by uh, Polk County Health, the National Weather Service Office, me, and any other interested parties. So those are my recommendations uh, for you to consider. And I'm sure we will be talking through the winter and spring. And we are at the ready. As a matter of fact, Polk County Health is committed to funding a project to update the heat warning system based upon the agreement that we reach on how we do this. And I promise to have it running in experimental mode on May 1st and in operational mode after two weeks of testing on May 15th. And it'll be an update. Look like that Dallas-Fort Worth site. Look like the, update, look like the site uh, with the updates. So thanks. That's it for the formal presentation. And I, again, appreciate your hanging in. And by the way, on the PowerPoint, I have on certain complicated slides, you see that little horn uh, I've actually dictated and said things on the PowerPoint. So if you press on that little horn symbol, you will hear me and all my glory talking it out. So um, on the more complicated slides, you can actually hear my voiceover for some of those slides. And thank you again for the compliment. OK, thank you. Are there uh, any other questions for Dr. Kalkstein? Okay, hearing none, uh, thank you everyone for joining today's webinar. Dr. Kalkstein, thank you very much for your time and for sharing your findings with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. It was my pleasure and uh, always fun to talk to you guys. Uh, I'm here at the ready when you need me. Okay, thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone. All right, bye-bye all.